In 1978, in northern Queensland, Australia, a family vacation turned into a nightmare that would haunt two nations for decades. The Wilsons, an American family of four, vanished without a trace, leaving behind only their abandoned hire car and a mystery that would take years to unravel. It wasn't until a chance encounter between a dying farmer and a young nurse that the truth finally came to light. The following is a dramatization of an audio recording made by Sarah Thompson at the Mount Isa Hospital in Queensland, Australia on August 15, 1996. My name's John Murphy. I'm a cane farmer from Mount Isa. I'm 68 years old and I'm making this recording to set the record straight because I don't have much time before the cancer gets me. Back in November 78, I'd just been released from prison for a few months. I'd served six years for manslaughter, a terrible accident that haunts me to this day. It's just a stupid fight with my best mate, Billy. We were both drunk, arguing over some girl we both fancied. Things got heated, and before I knew it, my fist connected with his jaw. He stumbled back, lost his footing, and then cracked his head on the edge of the bar. He died right there on the floor. My life changed forever. Mount Isa was even smaller back then, and the whole town turned against me. They called me a murderer, a monster. And even after I served my time, I couldn't escape the guilt and the shame. I became a bit of a recluse. I just stayed on the farm, avoiding people as much as I could. It was the only place I could escape the accusing stares and the whispers. One afternoon, I was out checking the fences on the far edge of my property. I remember it like it was yesterday. It had been a beautiful day. I had never even seen one cloud in the sky. And for that time of year, it was really mild. Anyway, the sun had gone down and I was about half a kilometre away from my truck when I heard a gunshot. Startled the hell out of me, to be honest. But worse was the screams that followed. It was kids. It sounded like it was coming from the old camping ground on the other side of the road from my property. It was a spot popular with the tourists back in the day, but it was rare to see anyone there these days. I jumped the fence and started to run towards it. I was a bit fitter in those days. But I wasn't more than halfway there when two more shots rang out. I didn't slow down until I was closer, wishing like hell I'd brought my shotgun with me. But the worst thing I thought I'd have to contend with that day was snakes in the sugar cane. There was only one car in the car park, and through the trees I could see the glow of a campfire. I couldn't hear a thing, and I wondered if the third shot I'd heard as I was running was the shooter offing themselves. I crept closer. My heart was pounding in my chest. I had no idea what I was walking into. When I reached the edge of the campsite, I saw something that'll haunt me till my dying day. There was a man standing over the bodies of his wife and two young children. He was just staring down at them, muttering. He was holding a gun. It was a revolver. I couldn't really make out what he was saying, but the words I told you were in there. I was no coward, but I wasn't about to give my life when the damage had already been done. There were no mobile phones back then, so my plan was to get to my car and call the police when I got home. I was backing away and I trod on a stick. Right then, the crack of that stick breaking sounded as loud as a gunshot had. That mundrel spun around and he looked right at me, stared right in my eyes. He raised the gun and started stomping towards me. I must admit, I froze. I thought the jig was up for me. He was only five feet away when I heard a hollow click. The bastard had pulled the trigger, but it had misfired somehow. That click woke me up and I charged at him. I tackled him hard and we fell to the dust, grappling for the gun. He was strong, but so was I, and I had the advantage of being on top. Still, I couldn't get the gun off him. The best I could do was keep it squeezed between us. And then it happened. The gun went off. For, for a second, I wondered if it was me who'd copped the bullet, and I just didn't know it. But then he sighed and went and limp under me. I read the gun out of his hand and rolled off him. I pointed it back at him, but he was done. I collapsed, staring up at the stars, trying to get my breath back. When I finally got up, I saw the wind in his chest, there was no coming back from that. I was in shock, but I had enough sense about me to check the lady and the poor little kids for signs of life. They were gone. Their lives cut short by the bastard who was supposed to love and protect them. I knew I should call the police, but I hesitated. I'd just been released from prison and I had no idea how I would explain this. 
The man's death was an accident, the result of our struggle for the gun, but who would believe me? My prints were all over it. I had a record, the history of violence, a repeat offender who had finally snapped and taken more lives. It was then I made a decision that would haunt me for the rest of my days. I decided to bury them, to hide the evidence of what had happened. I couldn't bear the thought of going back to prison for something I hadn't done. I wrapped their bodies in tubs and I drove them out to the deep water hole at the rear of my property. I weighed them down with rocks and threw the gun in after them. We have 5,000 acres, so no one was going to be firing them anytime soon or ever. It was hard work and it took me all night. Then I went back to that campsite and I cleaned up the mess, erasing any trace of what had happened there. I drove the family's car north into the middle of nowhere, and then I wiped it clean of my prints and left it there. I left the keys in the ignition, and then I hitched my way back. I hoped that someone would find it, and that the police would just assume that the family had disappeared, walked off into the outback, never to be seen again. For months I watched as the news reported on the missing Wilson family from America. Their family came to Australia to help find them. It killed me seeing the pain in their faces as they begged for information. And all the while, I had to keep quiet. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't give any information now because I'd covered the whole thing up. I thought about ending it all then, just writing a letter to clear it up and then hanging myself in the shed. But I had kids and a wife too, and they'd stood by me the whole time I'd been in trouble for killing Billy. I couldn't do it to them. My wife's gone five years now and the kids are grown up and have their own minds. It's time to come clean. I can't keep the secret any longer. So anyway, this is my confession. Sarah, I need you to promise me that you'll take this recording to the police, and I swear on my kids' lives that everything is true, and I'm truly sorry for not coming forward when it happened. It's John Murphy. Sarah handed the tape into police the next morning. With the information provided by John Murphy's deathbed confession, the police reopened the still notorious cold case of the Wilson family's disappearance. As a matter of urgency, detectives went to the hospital to interview John Murphy that very afternoon, only to discover he had passed away quietly during the night after completing his final act of atonement. Police divers located and recovered the remains of the four members of the Wilson family, the remains of Mary Wilson and her two daughters, Bethany and Jenny, were repatriated to the United States by a specially charted flight and were laid to rest in a somber ceremony attended by their surviving extended family and friends. James Wilson's relatives chose to leave his remains in Australia, where they were disposed of without ceremony or memorial. For more creepy stories like this, please subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified. <laughs>